Uh, thank you very much. Um, right, so um, I'm going to be talking about uh, an ongoing project that many of you guys are already familiar with um, about uh, creating a, a three high resolution 3D neurotransmitter receptor atlas. So kind of like the big brain, but for neurotransmitter receptors. <clears throat> Um, so uh, many of you have already heard uh, earlier iterations of this talk, but for people uh, who are new, um, I'll go through sort of uh, what the data looks like and where we are to date. And then after that, I'll, I'll give some uh, updates about, uh, about the project. Um, so to begin with, uh, we're working with uh, odd radiographs, um, which are a little bit different from uh, cell body stained uh, histology. Um, specifically, the brain is extracted fresh uh, from the donor, uh, then cut into slabs of tissue, uh, which you can see uh, here. These are then shock frozen and uh, then cryosectioned and uh, bathed in a radio ligand which will bind to different uh, neurotransmitter receptors. Um, these raw, raw autoradiographs uh, can then be uh, transformed uh, to reflect uh, the true receptor binding densities in the images. So sort of like the goal of the project here then is that we have all of these different uh, odd rate graphs and we'd like to be able to build atlas 3D atlases uh, like the like the big brain with them. Um, so the data that we're working with um, is uh, is quite unique and uh, in uh, the data I've been working with specifically has expanded a bit since uh, last time. And um, so of course we have uh, the human data, uh, but now I'm also working with uh, macaque and rat data as well and reconstructing those, which is quite exciting. Um, so uh, these autorator graphs uh, reflect uh, the sort of main neurotransmitter families, glutamate, GABA, acetylcholine, noradrenaline, and, and so on. Um, so there are obviously a lot of challenges to uh, doing this reconstruction. Um, first of all, obviously the fact that the autorator graphs have different uh, intensities, intensity di distributions. Um, the fact that the brains are extracted fresh means that they are heavily deformed, um, which uh, adds a lot of challenges. There's a lot of incomplete sections at the edges of the slabs I mentioned. Um, and there's some variability in how the data was acquired, which also adds to some challenges. Um, to address all these issues, uh, I built a, a pipeline that kind of goes through um, each step systematically and uh, tries to uh, take these 2D sections in combination with a reference volume and produce uh, 3D uh, receptor maps for um, each one of the uh, autorator graphs that we have. Um, the basic outline of the of the pipeline is that there's a pre-processing step where we do the automated cropping and, and so on of the autorator graphs. Um, then there's a, an initial reconstruction where we align the uh, raw autorator graphs to one another. Um, and then we take this initial reconstruction and then align it to the, <clears throat> uh, the reference uh, brain. In, in the hum case of the humans, that would be the uh, postmortem post uh, T1 donor MRI. Um, and then the last step, we actually uh, interpolate or uh, estimate missing receptor densities between uh, acquired sections. So if you imagine like, let's say this is a, an AMPA section, um, you have to go through another 20 sections before you get to the next AMPA section. So if we wanna create complete uh, receptor uh, maps, then we need to um, estimate what the AMPA distribution would be between the two acquired uh, AMPA sections. Um, so there are uh, a few um, interesting updates uh, to this. And um, the first is that uh, uh, with Conrad, um, we uh, developed a, a deep learning based uh, gray matter segmentation um, that is now integrated into uh, the reconstruction process. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, another thing I've been working on a lot is creating quantitative uh, metrics to validate the reconstruction. So that's not just pretty pictures, but actually we have a, a certain confidence that the, the reconstruction is working well. And um, this is particularly important because there's a lot of processing steps, there's a lot of potential for interpolation error and so on. Um, as I mentioned, the, uh, the pipeline has now been extended to work both with macaque and uh, rat brains. Um, this is, uh, I think, quite interesting because it acts as sort of a proof of principle that the pipeline generalizes to new, new and very different data sets. Um, and so that if there are data sets lying around in, in hospitals or research centers around the world, then uh, this pipeline could potentially be um, a, a useful way to, to reconstruct them to 3D. Uh, specifically the macaque data, uh, there's no reference volume from the donor brain, so it has to be reconstructed with a stereotactic template. Uh, the macaque brains also have very sparse sampling, um, which is very challenging to deal with. Um, and then there's also the fact that it, it includes myelin and cell body stain sections. So the fact that we can reconstruct those shows that the pipeline isn't just limited to um, autoradiographs, but really to any sort of 2D histological brain section. 
Um, and uh, finally, uh, I won't go too much into detail about this because it's a, a bit of uh, engineering nerdery, but um, there were some, uh, the, the reconstruction used uh, had, a, or had a very big memory footprint, um, and now that's been uh, reduced so it can actually push the reconstruction beyond the 250 microns that had been kind of stuck at before to 125 and eventually 50 microns to really create um, uh, an ultra high resolution atlas um, on a similar scale to the, the big brain. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the first step, or rather the second step of the pipeline is uh, the inter-autorator graph alignment. Um, and that's so basically they were just doing rigid alignments between the autorator graphs, which produces what you see here. Um, the challenge then is that we have these slabs of reconstructed receptor volumes and we have to align them to the MRI. That's very tricky to do. Um, and the way that I found to, to simplify the task is actually uh, simplify the problem to one of unimodal alignment between two gray matter masks. So extracting a gray matter mask from the, uh, the reference volume with the donor MRI in this case um, is not too difficult, um, but it is much more challenging for the uh, receptor volume. And so this is where the, the deep learning based approach that, uh, that Conrad uh, and I developed uh, comes into play. Um, the idea is uh, somewhat similar to what Eric just uh, presented, where we use the big brain to, um, uh, to create synthetic data and then train a neural network on the synthetic data uh, of 2D sections based off of the big brain to perform segmentation, uh, gray matter, white matter, background segmentation. Um, if you want to, I won't go into the details of it. If you want to know more about it, uh, uh, Conrad uh, uh, had a poster at OHBM uh, where he goes into more detail. Um, suffice to say that it, it works quite well and it actually generalizes uh, very well to different modalities, different, um, uh, different species. So for example, here, just as an example, I believe this is a macaque uh, section. And the, uh, the network, which has never seen a macaque before, actually works quite well. Um, and Conrad also drew um, his artistic rendition of the cortex. And even on totally fake data, the, the network worked quite well. Um, so then from, uh, from this uh, sort of initial alignment, we can get a, a gray matter mask that is then much easier to um, align to the uh, donor uh, or to the reference volume. Uh, and to show that it, it uh, generalizes quite well, this is uh, the gray matter mask that's generated for the macaque uh, data, which is quite good. If it looks a little bit uh, rougher than the previous one, that's because this is only a, at one millimeter. And um, because of the gaps between uh, the sections that I mentioned before, because of the sparse sampling, um, it creates uh, a lot of sort of like uh, jagged interpolation artifacts that we can't really get around because we're missing a lot of data. Um, oh, and also, uh, so um, unfortunately, this method does not generalize to everything quite yet. So uh, this is a, uh, the rat reconstruction that I, I mentioned. Um, and so here, um, CAPS doesn't, uh, sorry, that's the acronym for the, uh, for the network. Um, it, the, the algorithm doesn't work quite yet. So this is just using um, uh, histogram intensity uh, segmentation. Um, but because it, we're working with synthetic data, it shouldn't be too hard to generate new synthetic data for rat brains, macaque brains, or whatever other species we're interested in reconstructing. Um, and so the, the alignment that you, you get from, uh, from the pipeline then, uh, you can see it for the human and macaque, it's aligned to um, a surface representation of the human and macaque cortex respectively. Um, in the case of the rat, uh, there, we don't, I don't have a, a surface to work with, so it's just aligned to the um, to the uh, stereotaxic template. Uh, and in all cases, you see that it, it aligns uh, quite well. Um, there's still some uh, imperfections, but that's not so much due to the pipeline, so much as due to um, some, uh, some errors in pre-processing where like background artifacts are still kept in the, uh, in the cropped iterator graphs and that can throw off the, the, the pipeline. But overall, um, it works quite well across different species, um, which is pretty cool. Um, now, so like I said, these are so far just uh, pretty pictures. And so I've tried to come up with ways to quantify the accuracy of the reconstruction. Probably the most important is to verify the alignment of the sections. Um, and to do that, I uh, for each uh, section, uh, this is just for the humans, uh, for each uh, 2D uh, autorator graph, I calculated the, the dice score of its alignment to the uh, reference volume, the donor MRI in this case. Um, so each one of these points is a, a dice score for how well a section is aligned to the donor MRI. Um, and this is done on a per slab basis. So the, the brain is cut is was sectioned into 
slabs, and each one of these colors is a different slab. Um, on the x-axis, you have the normalized distance across the slab of tissue. Uh, so what that means is like this is the back of a slab of tissue, this is the front. And what we see is overall the dice score is quite good. The average is uh, 0.91, which is uh, really not bad, um, but it drops off a ton uh, at the edges. Um, and uh, that's not uh, too surprising because if you look at actually which are the ones, which are the sections where the uh, alignment fails, it's these four are qualitative examples that you see here. Um, so even uh, an expert anatomist might um, struggle to figure out which part of the of the cortex this is, for example. So in that case, it's not surprising that the, the pipeline fails. Um, and in this case, this would be a useful sort of heuristic for figuring out at what point in a tissue slab can we no longer trust uh, or use the, the sections that are further out or um, and at what point do we just drop those and use the ones that uh, we have more confidence in? Um, I am a little bit short on time, so I will skip over this. Um, so um, for uh, another validation step that we took is to um, sort of estimate how well we were interpolating between uh, acquired sections. So if you imagine a slab of, of tissue here that's been aligned and all that, um, these are just sections for a particular receptor, in this case, the uh, muscarinic M2 receptor. Um, and so part of the, the, the last step of the pipeline is to sort of fill in the gaps between these, uh, these sections. Um, so there's a lot of uh, estimation going on there and we'd like to have some sense of how good that is. Um, right, so this is where you see the, the reconstructed, the fully reconstructed volumes. Um, and uh, to, to assess the quality of the uh, estimation, what uh, I did was um, apply the uh, interpolation algorithm, the surface-based interpolation algorithm that we used to estimate the missing receptor densities, applied them within acquired sections. So within the acquired section, we know the ground truth, we know what the receptor densities are. And so when we apply this, uh, this surface-based approach, we can see how well do our estimated uh, values correlate to the, uh, the ground truth values in the acquired section. Um, and the overall results, I've got a very high correlation uh, for all of the receptors uh, between the true and estimated receptor binding densities within acquired sections. Um, so the overall correlation between uh, for, for all of the receptors is 0.98. Um, and it, uh, there's a little bit of variability for, for some, uh, more variability for some uh, receptors than others, but overall um, it, it works quite nicely. And so that gives us a sense that um, uh, the, um, the estimation that we're doing to fill in the gaps between the sections is uh, reliable. Um, so there's uh, some, some ongoing uh, work uh, as we head sort of into the home stretch of finally uh, finishing this project. Um, one issue that we still have is that we have to correct for uh, slab effects. Uh, so there are some slab effects between, uh, or uh, intensity differences, average intensity differences between the slabs of tissue uh, that we have. So if any of you have uh, 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 clever ideas of how to solve that, um, uh, please uh, get in contact because I'd be interested to, to know more. Um, there's also, so everything that I mentioned so far is, is primarily geared towards uh, uh, cortical uh, reconstruction. Um, and so uh, I have to uh, integrate the, the code for the, the subcortical uh, volumetric reconstruction. And then finally, um, we'll be in good shape to uh, apply the pipeline to the, the remaining data and, uh, and crank out some uh, receptor atlases that uh, you all can use uh, for your own research. Um, and so with that, um, I'd like to thank uh, the, the fine people that I work with, uh, Nicola, uh, Katrin at uh, Jüdisch Forschungszentrum. Uh, and then this project started during my PhD. So of course I have to thank uh, my uh, PhD supervisors, Alex Thiel and Alan Evans. Um, and also Conrad Waxdale, who uh, has uh, helped uh, a lot throughout this uh, whole process. And um, yeah, so uh, thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions if you guys have any.